Okay, so um, thank you for coming. Thank you, Sharon, for uh, really organizing all of this and putting us all together in a group where we are encouraged to share with each other. And we're a small enough group that when you hit reply all, it doesn't, you know, uh, out, outstrip your computer's capacity to respond. And Jim, thank you for all that you do for us because it's through uh, Verse Virtual that many of us met. And thank you for taking on the tasks that you, and being willing to be co-host, even though my thing wouldn't allow it. <laughs> and uh, and for taking on the task of sending us to uh, the YouTube afterwards so that other people who couldn't come today can read. I have a list, which is sort of the way you signed up to read, uh, to reply rather, that Sharon sent me. And I put it in order and we're just, I'm just gonna go down the list. And uh, if you don't want to be first, Cynthia, <laughs> you can tell me afterwards. But right now I'm gonna ask everybody to mute, except Sharon, Jim, and me, unless you have background noise. And um, if you're going to be doing something in the, you know, in your screen area, I mean, hey, we're all on different time zones. We understand that. Um, please just go ahead and put your avatar on. Um, take off your video. It's not that we don't love you. It's not that we don't want to eat or drink with you. But in a video, it can be kind of weird. So <laughs> uh, we're going to do that. And I will mute. Uh, if you have comments, um, put them in the chat, please. Uh, I'll leave the chat open while we're uh while we're talking, you know, while we're doing it, we're going to each read one poem as we go through. And then if there's time, we can read a second poem. Okay. Everybody ready? Everybody muted? All righty. Uh, Cynthia, are you ready, dear? Okay. Just going to get yours. Okay. Great. Okay. I'll mute myself here. And Cynthia, I, you know, I don't have bios of you. Uh, so I would like you to just say one line about who you are, where you, how you met how you came across Sharon and uh, how you've got into this. So if you don't mind, thank you. Not, not at ahead. all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I'm Cynthia and I um, have been, have been, I surprised myself by starting to write poetry again about three years ago. I hadn't written since college prior to that, but I've, I've, um, I'm finding writing and exploring poetry to be, um I know, essential to my authentic self-expression in the world and sharon reached out to me when she had read some poems of mine on i think verse virtual and Heimat review would be the two places but um she's seen my poetry in a number of places and is always so positive and encouraging so um, I will go, I will be brave and go first. And I'll just say that when I go to poetry readings, I love it if they show the text on the screen as well as just speaking. It helps me follow. So I was really pleased that Jim asked you to let us screen share. And I think I'll do the same. Um, so this, this poem has been accepted for the spices and seasonings series but has not yet appeared so it will be they they don't tell you when your poem is going to be published or at least they haven't told me yet so this one hasn't been shared with this group yet let me get it up on the screen and share the screen okay and let's see all right so that's the share would it be helpful to make the type bigger? Probably make it a little bigger. Okay. Is that can is Joan? Is that readable? I can't can't hear you. You're you're muted. Huh? It's readable, but you'll have to scroll as you read. Yes, I will have this to scroll. Part of it. Okay. okay. All right. So this poem is called Bobby and Zadie, 1959. Horseradish, grated, mixed with vinegar, a little sugar, salt, in a white porcelain bowl with its own silver spoon resting on the rim. 
ready to spread over the gefilte fish that Bubby makes. She rubs raw white fish against a chrome grater, then onions, carrots, a bit of skin off her knuckles, adds eggs, a sprinkle of flour, pepper and salt, shapes with wet hands, poaches in bubbling broth. Horse. Zadie gets up at 3 a.m., heads for the stable, oats in feed bag, curry comb, harness, wagon, off to haymarket to buy potatoes, cabbage, grapefruit, and pears, a little penny candy for the kids, holds the reins lightly up and down the neighborhoods, calls to the housewives, a nickel, a carrot, an apple, a dime. Back home at midday, a mountain of coins on the kitchen table. My Zadie, a rich man. Radish, thin red sharpness lurking among the bland green iceberg and cukes. Tangy crunch. Don't offer it to a horse, said Zadie. He'll think it's going to be an apple, then spit it out all over you. Lunchtime, horseradish on the filter fish for Zadie. Salad, rye bread, buttermilk. Blintz is fried in butter for me. A busy day in the kitchen. Oy vey, oy vey, tired feet. Inside, cottage cheese and farmer's cheese. Sugar, egg yolk, vanilla. Sour cream, not horseradish, on top. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're muted. Thank you, Jim. Maybe I better stay unmuted. Um, our next reader is Sean. And then after Sean will be um, Kavita and then Marianne. So I'll give you a little warning there. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm Sean and I'm in Volcano, Hawaii. And I, let's see, how did I start writing? Well, I have had breast cancer twice. And the second breast cancer kind of serendipitously, I ran into a Molly Fisk writing group on Facebook, and it just seemed to segue nicely that I could write while I was going through this thing. Um, so I've been doing that for about two years. And then I started submitting, and Jim took some of my poems. And because he took my poems, Sharon read my poems. And so that full circle, how I ended up with you guys. So that's my short story. Um, I'm going to read one called Stories, and it actually came from one of the prompts that Molly uses. She gives us a visual and a written prompt. And so the written for this was, what is? tell us what is in your basket. So that's why this became this poem. And it's called Stories. And I don't know how to screen share, so sorry. You guys are just going to have to listen to me. <clears throat> Stories. You can tell a lot about people in the grocery store. Whole stories can be told as I watch them checking off lists, doing mental math, loading carts and baskets, arranging their items on the conveyor belt in the checkout line. The elderly Japanese couple comparing and contrasting the cost and ply of toilet tissue. A construction worker, unlaced boots, covered in drywall dust, with a cold pack of green bottles and three containers of poke. The handsome husband in produce, cell phone in hand, patiently asking, round onions or spring onions, babe? Two women in their mu'u mu'u, blocking the aisle, laughing and gossiping and oblivious. Hippies buying sprouts and tofu. But is that a box of donuts I see tucked under the almond milk? A local mom checking all her coupons, more babies in her cart than food. The bandy-legged guy with the big gold cross is flirting with the butcher as she stocks the shelves with pork butt, while another lonely guy pushes his cart to the front, filled with liters of vodka and canned stew. I bring my own bags, group my items by category for the checker's ease have my frequent buyer card ready to scan, help the bagger when they are slammed. I wonder if someone is telling a story about me. Thank you. 
little bit. That's really great. Um, are you ready, Kavita? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kavita Ezekiel Mendonca, and I am originally from Bombay, India, now known as Mumbai. Very hard to pronounce for me. Um, I've been in Calgary for almost 25 years now, and I've been writing poetry and teaching poetry for a very long time. Um, I made friends with uh, Rosie Freed, who happens to have a Bombay connection. Her grandfather or great-grandfather has a bakery in Bombay, which is still there. Oh. And um, so she says we are cousins. And, uh, and she introduced me to Sharon. And uh, of course, uh, a friend of mine introduced me to Jim and Verse Virtual, the platform I love best of all my poetry platforms. Um, I just really enjoy everybody there. And Jim is uh, very, I always say to all my friends, very open-minded and very compassionate. Two of the qualities that are extremely important to me uh, as I was raised in that way. So thank you, Jim, and thanks to Joan. Um, I worked in an um, international school up in the foothills of the Himalaya Mountains, or Himalaya Mountains, as you pronounce it. And I'm just going to read a short poem called Shades of Himalayan Light. Um, the school was called Woodstock. I joined the school because I thought it was a music festival, but <laughs> it wasn't. It was an international school, so I taught English there for 16 years before coming to Calgary. So this is my poem, Shades of Himalayan Light. The Himalayan son a lumiere plays. God seems closer, sky, mountain, earth, touch. Fingers of radiance brush morning eyes. Prayers rise to meet him, author of the show. The snake plant turns red at monsoon time, emerging from a bed of fallen leaves. Shifting shadowy light paints its shades of pink. Swinging monkey tails change trees to dust colored. The langurs remain ashy and black in all light. The orderly herd of gray elephants on the dry riverbed, sometimes clear, often vanish in changing light. The cab climbs the winding road, the black vultures turn shadowy, skin and bone skeletons, some standing by the roadside, some left behind in the crooked tree in deepening dusk light. The thick misted valley elicits prayers for safety. God replies, sorry, God replies, lights the road, lifts the mist, and the Shivaliks stand clear in answered prayer. Thank you. I especially love those last lines. And those uh, Shivalik mountains are the ones that you see as you climb up the road to Masuri, which is the mm -hmm. town where the school was, and there's all the mountains. So from the station, you have to take a cab, which is kind of about two and a half hours up, but it's a very long journey from Bombay. It's almost more than 24 hours, different trains and cabs, etc. So, and there's a spot there where the vultures are, there's a tree there, so, and the elephants. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, Marianne, you're next. Hi. And then after you will be Jim and Joe. Okay. I think I am going to share my screen. Okay. Um, my voice is a little rough. I have some sort of a cold. I, I guess I think I got it over my father's, but he's fine. I'm the one who has the cold. You know, my. Anyway, um, I'm originally from Massachusetts, but I live in Rockville, Maryland with uh, my husband, who's at the conference now, and um, my cat, Tyler, who's sitting beside me. And uh, um, I, I met Sharon when I think I had some poems published in Verse Virtual, and she want, you know, she was intrigued. So, okay, and the poem I want to read, it's a new poem. It's a poem about a new phenomenon, relatively new phenomenon, poetry readings on Zoom. Zoom readings. Not so long ago, three years now, 
poets' living rooms and bedrooms opened windows to their bright souls. True, true, we couldn't crouch beside their bookshelves or gaze at CD towers to look for what we wished we had, what we wished we'd kept. Neither could we stand in kitchens, drink tap water or beer, and just talk. We too could only wander our picked over suburbs, not theirs. We couldn't find the streams that ran through their palms or the corner store where they stopped for coffee beans and muffins. But that year we visited poets. We watched a husband play trumpet, then switch on loops of percussion while his wife chanted words we could only imagine in the haze of sound that smeared the bare white walls like ones we once had, once before we settled down in no man's land. We heard a man recite poems to Frida in a room with blue walls, with collages in a house just north of Mexico's border, so many miles from her blue house. We saw a woman in Thailand reading from her vintage notebook as birds chirped and white flowers bloomed, so many miles from our takeout of drunken noodles with tofu, fried catfish, mangoes with sticky rice. Thank you. Thank you. That, that was lovely. Thanks. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm i gonna be just giving a quick comment since I wanna make sure that I give attention to who's next. And that would be Jim. Yes. Screen sharing. Okay. If I can find the right. I have too many windows open to show everything. I understand that one. Okay. It looks like you don't get to uh, enjoy my. Oh, yes, you do. Here we are. This was a poem written because I love fairy tales and fantasy stories, and I often wonder how I would fit into those. So this is called Twins. Jekyll was just Jim and I. The faces and the oddities, nobility and meanness, alternate grins and leers, running through days, spilling into years, the day and night, shadow and light of who I am. And you are Cinderella, Buried beauty, heart that sees in this pumpkin of a man, golden transport to your dreams. You left your slipper once, some noon or midnight, not in flight, but by design, etched around with careful verse that called me by name, and didn't care at all that Jekyll was just Jim and I. Mm -hmm. Is that from your unpublished archive? Yes. It's a beautiful piece. I want to send it somewhere, Jim, so more people can see it and read it. It's lovely. Send um, it to Joe, me. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Who said that, Sharon? Was that you who said that? Okay. Sharon says send it to her so she can put it up. Joe? Yeah. There you are. Okay. Hi. My dog's are going wild in the background. But he's quiet at this moment so this is a good moment um I, you know i i grew up just a few miles from where marianne lives now although it was a far different landscape back then and now i live not just a few miles from where cynthia lives although we've never met um it's interesting the connections um we make on zoom um I'm just deciding at this moment which one to read here. I'll just go with the one that's on the top of my pile. Um, my background, you probably know, I made my living repairing houses. Um, and I often write about it and about the people. Um, I often felt I was repairing lives as much as repairing houses. Anyway, this is called Elena's Dollar. Elena, who paints her eyes green, 
giving greenbacks to Greenpeace, a abandoned by husband, she blames pollution, and by friends, a bit strident she is, hires me when a water pipe detaches from her one-room shack, which is sliding down a green hillside. Elena is none too happy about any of it. The slow landslide, like a lover's betrayal, the emergency repair charge of $100, though anybody else would charge $300. I tell her it's my friendly rate, though she's no friend. She pays with a sheaf of ones and fives, plus a jar of quarters and dimes. Count if you don't trust me. I tell her it's about accuracy, not trust. So I count while she scowls. And then I give back one quarter, two dimes. Back home early, Rose is there. Idly fingering the money, she says, Elena needs love, but how do you hug a cocklebur? She finds an extra dollar, says I should return, but right now, quickly, she wants to make love before the kids come home. The dog needs a walk. Shoes and paws are wet. Dinner needs to cook and serve. When I finally see Elena, she says to keep that green back. She has cancer and it won't be long. Anything left will go to the hospital's giant sucking treasury. You should have charged me more. I'll probably never see you again. She blames pollution. Okay, okay. I'll donate a dollar to Greenpeace. That's it. That was that was beautiful, Joe. <laughs> that was really beautiful. I'll tell you, I've never read that. It's not published. It's in fact I just wrote it. Um I, I like to use Zoom. Um, as a testing ground, um, you know, I, I miss having live readings. Zoom's a, not a very good substitute, but it's better than nothing. So, yeah. I, I, and when you're among friends, it's safe. It's a safe place to fail, you know, before you go out in the world. So, thank you for providing this. Well, it was you, wonderful. You you know you can send that to Verse Virtual. <laughs> Noted. Okay, um, who's next? Oh yeah, Mary, you're next. I can't screen share either. Um, just don't know how to do it. Um, this is something that hasn't found a home yet. Uh, it is a, a kind of story. Um, um, oh, little introduction. I live in Florida, unfortunately. Uh, which isn't really good for the psyche at all. Um, and I've been writing really forever, but I had some health issues, some serious health issues, uh, both mental and physical. And writing writing was my salvation. I wrote my way out of it. Okay, this is called Millie. It was easy for us to be wild together. That August at the first ever street art fair meant as counterpoint to the big one downtown with no local artists with its industrial strength prices, both for art and the space to show it. We were the ragamuffin crew building our own display outside the liquor store and the psychedelic groove of the local bars. That year, we sold nothing but had many admirers in the crowd, cash poor students and Hare Krishna devotees, hands full of flowers and incense ready to see angels and demons alive and shining in our paintings. They could appreciate, but not afford. And it was all okay. Liquor so close to hand and the generous smoke layered like stratus in the air all around us. Okay, even when the storm swept all our stuff down before it and we had to rescue and refit back in only hours to sit there and sell nothing while the bands played acid rock and everyone wore rags and spangles like gypsy queens. You never bailed, even when I was far too enthusiastic with the vodka, crying drunk and something to manage before our ride came 
to ferry us in all our work back home. You thought I left you sober enough to blame, but no blame was cast, no punishment offered, more than what the body pays for such wild indulgence. Years later, you gifted me again when I had abandoned everything, even speech, and was blind in the darkest room, the one you might never leave alive, and there was no laughing matter nothing light enough to free the smothered breath from its sour confinement. Kept close as I was, under lock and key, being preserved, I thought, like some desiccated fruit or flower already dead. But it was Easter, time of miracles and resurrections, and you came to me, my sister friend, no cheerful, not with prayers, and sympathy, no cheerful flowers or candy eggs, but a perfect chocolate gun. The bold hilarity there to rescue me, push me into laughter, even in that last sad theater of dust. Thank you. Powerful, Mary. <clears throat> that was really powerful. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Allery? You're next, and then after you, it'll be uh, Alan, and then uh, Jackie. I do know how to uh, screen share, but I didn't come prepared to do that. And I don't see very well, so it just gets me confused. So here we go. This poem was written for my 40th wedding anniversary to my husband, which is, has been six years ago now. Taking forever one day at a time. I love the way you return from errands with the present, a Danish book or bottle of champagne. How you thank me for every meal from Coco Vin to a ham sandwich and make coworkers think I'm Julia Child. Hearing your voice in conversation downstairs before realizing that you're talking to the cats in the same serious tone you use with plumbers. <laughs> How you told me I was funny long before anyone else did. That time in France, when I said our waiter looked like Orlando Bloom and you answered, then we'll have to come back tomorrow. The fun of reading a book you've just finished and finding, oops, duh, or what a jerk, pen penciled in the margin. The way you reach for my hand before crossing the street. How you describe every dark-eyed brunette, she looks like you, no matter how silver I go. No wonder 40 years have sneaked by. Thank you. I hope he was there and hear those words. I hope he's at least read it. Um, Alan, you're up. Um, okay. Thanks for having me, Joan and, and Sharon and Jim. Uh, this, this poem is about events that took place about a year ago, and it's been a little too raw to read it anywhere or share it anywhere, but I, I think uh, I'm ready for it. My family's ready to hear it, although they're <laughs> not listening as usual. Um, it's called Hospice. The intake goes so long. Most of us have hardly breathed since the nurse arrived. Meantime, she orders morphine, enough to make any of us care a little less and depends, the nurse says, just in case. The patient, sure there is no God, decides against pastoral visits, unless the rabbi needs someone to argue the other side. And she assures the nurse, he would never wet herself, not in this lifetime at least. But please, she insists, 
see what you can do to get me out of here quick so nothing goes to waste. The family is getting impatient by now and leans closer in to hear any news that might make this easier. When asked, I apologize for adding so little. I'm only the son-in-law. The patient says, but your presence lends such calm, mistaking me perhaps for Ativan. As I cast a pleasant pall over the assembled, who silently pray, may everyone who needs to go be quickly on their way. That was beautiful, Alan. Thanks. Was, I can understand why that would be hard to write. Uh, Jackie, you're next, and then Rose, and then Laurie, did you have something? Well, I think she may have had to leave. Yeah, there you go. There you are. So Hi. Jackie, Jackie, then Rose. Hi. Hi. Um, can everybody hear me? And And excuse me, do you prefer to be called Jacqueline? I'm sorry. On a book, I'm Jacqueline. Socially, I'm Jackie. <laughs> okay, because I have a very good friend who's Jacqueline, and she calls herself Jackie, and so I automatically applied it to you, and I apologize for automatically. Yeah, that's right. Socially, I'm always Jackie, but okay. just but on books, I like Jacqueline. Um, I connected with Sharon um, through your daily poem, but I also have been a part of the Verse Virtual community. Thank you very much, Jim. And um, I um, have been writing for a long time. I write for both children and adults. And I um, have several books for both. <laughs> so this is a book. This is from my collection, Manna in the Morning. And this is a story from the Bible connecting it to myself. And it's called Joseph's Fortune and Mine. If not for jealous brothers and a convenient pit, Joseph would have stayed in Canaan, favored by Jacob, flaunting his multicolored coat. But no worries, he found success as a slave in Egypt, appointed head of household until Potiphar's wife brazenly pursued his beautiful biceps. Behind bars for a crime he didn't commit, Joseph foretold dreams, serenely waiting for favor to find him again in Pharaoh's court. So if not for the pit, Potiphar's wife in prison, Joseph would not have been dressed in royal robes, welcoming his brothers with generous guile. Good fortune following calamity, a phenomenon enjoyed by more than Joseph in Genesis. If I stop sniffling long enough to note where each crooked turn in the road has ended for me. If only I'd cried less when cast aside in the pit, felt less jil jilted by a jealous world plotted against me. Maybe, like Joseph, I too would have waited with fewer complaints for a better destiny to unfold. Thank you. Wise words, wise words. Uh, Rose? Okay, I, I am too much of a mess to go into great detail. Uh, I have always written poetry, but it started off in German, and then I had to wait many, many years before I dared to do it in English. I'm, as many of you know, I live in Lima, Peru. I'm married to a Peruvian. And I'm bilingual, also Spanish and English. And um, I had my first poem in verse virtual when Firestone was still running the show. And Jim is doing it so very well. And he deserved to be the editor. Uh, I'm sharing my screen because I can. <laughs> It's from my new book, the latest of seven, now it's the eighth, uh, Life Stuff. 
and I started at the back because normally we start to reading some of, uh, we start to read some of the first ones, but I thought this is ridiculous. I have to start at the back to make a change. Sunsets on Mars are blue. Scientists have just possibly found a medicine that slows the development of Alzheimer's. They're working on a vaccine against HIV. Astronomers capture radio signals from a distant galaxy. The Russians are getting a spacecraft ready on a rocket of some major proportions to rescue two astronauts from the stricken space station. SpaceX plans to use the Starship to fly a Japanese businessman around the moon. Oh, and several artists too. Wonder who? We'll soon be sending settlers to Mars. They'll be sitting on their porches, contemplating the Martian sunsets. Meanwhile, concerned citizens are afraid of people who doubt the gender they were assigned at birth. Afraid of people who love their own gender. Deny that slaves ever existed. Burn books. Idolize the golden calf and then some. The honorable justices of their so-called Supreme Court are denying women control of their bodies and possibly would like as a next step to forge a bond with the clergy of Iran who condemned to death by hanging any woman who shows her hair or with Afghanistan's Taliban who deny women the right to education, independent movement, and even Kabul's female mannequins are masked and hooded while sunsets on Mars are blue. Thank you. That was very insightful. Uh, Laurie, I, I, Gary and, no, Gary and Betsy aren't here. So Laurie, you're up. Yeah, there you go. Laura, Laura, uh, Le Laura, you have to unmute. You now, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'm um, saying, uh, yeah, I haven't learned how to do screen share yet. And also not so good at chatting, but I have been enjoying everyone's poems. Just wanted to mention that. Um, yeah, so I'm in Los Angeles and Sharon found me on your daily poem. Um, and I've been writing a long time. And the uh, the poem I'm going to read now is uh, kind of about what's happening now with is Israel and Hamas. Um, I lived in Israel a long time, and my family is there, so uh, pretty concerned about what's going on there. After the massacre on October seventh, all day long, from the moment we open our eyes to the moment before we close them at night, we check our phones for breaking news, for updates on the fate of the hostages, the war. More rockets, bombs, death, destruction. Our hearts fill with the stories of the survivors, witnesses to murder, rape, burning, beheading. I feel the horrors, atrocities, noise, chaos, become a knife digging into my lower back, the pain so bad I can barely bend down to tie my shoes. For a week more, I carry it around with me, walking with it, eating with it, sleeping with it. I take it with me to meet my friend. We sit in her daughter's backyard, talk about the war, about the hatred spilling out in our cities, Crowds chanting threats we thought we'd never hear in America. Still, something in me responds to this moment. The cushioned chair, coffee, cinnamon biscuits. My pain begins to loosen, melt, dissolve in the presence of the lemon tree in the corner, the toddler toys scattered about. I want to sit here forever with my friend and her daughter warmed by the sun, filling and filling with the quiet of this yard. 
Um, oh, and that comes to me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sharon wanted to be last. And Sharon, if you would email me which of the two poems you want me to read, because I think we only have time for, for one each. So, or actually, I might read two from Sharon. She's asked me to read for her because even though she, uh, she sometimes has some issues with her voice right now. So um, I get to read her poems too. So even though most of you don't know this, this is my birthday month. So I'm telling you, because why? Everybody should wish me a happy birthday. That's why. It's the 10th. It's Wednesday. Keep that in mind for sending a happy birthday message on Facebook. I love to be wished a happy birthday. And I'll be 76, just in case you want. Like the trombones in music me. I can watch it. Anyway, so I'm going to read you a poem from my new book. Thank you, Rose. Uh, it's uh, Feathers on Stone. And uh, one of the last books in it, sticking with the reading at the end there, is uh, called Aging. I'd like to age like this year's gift of birthday roses, now past their expected prime, but still beautiful. Bouquets from previous years have withered, died after a week, but these continue walking in beauty as if they each day salute sunrise with their own pollen. A few have browned at the edges of their orange-yellow splendorous petals. Leaves have browned and crackle like paper. The roses themselves are not only lovely, but also now exude an aroma strong enough to pulse through the dining room into the kitchen, wrapping me in their heady scent of love remembered each time I sit down for my morning coffee. It seems to me that scent, so rare in purchased hothouse roses, is even stronger now than when the roses first came home with my husband's grin. Each time I stroke a still soft petal, I think again how I want to age like these roses, velvet and strong, exuding the aroma of love, even in old age. And I forgot my own rule, which was to tell you how I met Sharon. Um, it's uh, I, uh, Sharon and I met through uh, Jim and Verse Virtual, for which I, I also was privileged to write under Fire of Stone also, and was so pleased uh, with what Jin was able to do to keep it going. And I, uh, I've also been on Your Daily Poem. So, and that's where I first encountered uh, Lori, actually, and Sharon did too. So now, Sharon, do you want me to read The Heir to the Throne or the one about uh, the, the, the poetry readings? Which one? Did you tell me? Do the first one. The, uh, Heir to the Throne? Oh, good, because I really like that one. I like the other one too, but this is um, this is this is a new one. Uh, some of you, if you haven't read your January verse virtual yet, um, Jim published it along with two other wonderful poems by Sharon, and this one really struck me personally, um, and I hope I do it justice uh, because it reminded me of, of things in my own family too. So um, Sharon has a way of of using um, her expressions of things that happen in her family in a way that just seems to be hit a universal note. So you're so talented at that, Sharon. So here I go, heir to the throne, right? Just as my father is getting ready to check out of Hotel Earth, my nephew swims through my sister's birth canal and when the two sets of piercing black eyes and bald heads meet, they smile as if gazing into a mirror. When my father takes a bow and exits the stage, his grandson takes up his passion for cooking and reading and writing. I see my father's smiling eyes and hear his laughter as I watch my nephew receive his diploma in English and recite the works of Steinbeck. Hemingway, 
and Poe to a classroom full of students who find him humorous and brilliant and writing short stories in his office while his wife and children sleep, just like his grandfather, my father. And now on my nephew's 39th birthday, I watch my father's tall, slim body bend over the backyard grill as his grandson flips sirloin steaks in the sunlight and serves them on paper plates with the grace of his grandfather, who is somewhere grilling steaks and teaching grammar content. His grandson is carrying on in the kingdom he built for him. Thanks for writing that, Sharon. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I, I, Sharon has another one. Well, let me go ahead and read your second one, Sharon. Sharon gets two, because after all, this is her meeting. Uh, this one is about uh, poetry readings, and um, that it will open up a little time for discussion So, with us. Um, you're, it's called The Invitation Reads. You're invited to a poetry reading with a tempting trail that leads to the gingerbread cake and candy house forbidden by my diabetes doctor. Don't go down that road, a voice whispers. But like Hansel and Gretel, I skip down the lane and find myself in a familiar land of storytellers whose heads lie face down on their computer keys. A voice says, when the host calls your name, you will awaken and recite your poem. When my name is called, my head is heavy and my mouth moves, but no words come out. Unmute yourself, the host hollers. Best not to bother her. She is probably writing another poem, Marianne mumbles. Sharon can make a poem out of anything. Shoshana sings, a poem writes itself. Everybody knows that, Join, Jim joins in. I feel a tap on my shoulder. You fell asleep at the computer again, my husband informs. Storyland disappears. And she said this poem was invited by a was inspired by a dream that kept repeating itself over and over every time she tried to sleep. And she decided finally it needed to be written. It, and it would only stop coming in the dream when she typed it on the computer. She says, once I started typing, the poem took a whole new direction. And when she was finished, she went back to bed and slept until 8 a.m. with no dream. I think we've all had an experience like that, but this is a great one, Sharon. And thank you so much for doing that. So everybody can unmute now and we can chat. What I a wonderful, that. wonderful reading. I just enjoy. I didn't write very much in the comments, but I just wanted you all to know that every single poem was absolutely thank wonderful you. in its in its own way. I, I, I'm so happy I came and uh, just thank you all. That's all. Yes, I'd like to oh. say thank you too. It was lovely. Yes, yes, this is this is great. And such a nice variety of poems, different emotions, different topics. Yeah. At I what point Sharon, do you want at what point do you want to stop recording? Um, I think I probably should stop recording now. Thanks for reminding me, Chin. Stop recording, stop recording, stop recording. Where is that little button? Hello, button. Upper left on your screen usually. Ah, oh, there it is, yes. Thanks. Uh, there it is and stop yes i want to stop